You're not allowed to mumble. You're not allowed to pretend you're singing. We're going to ask you, sing these to the Lord, right? So we're here, we're celebrating together. So sing to the Lord. So just because the music, you know, like the recorded music. So Mo is trying to adjust the volume of my microphone, which you suddenly hear very big now. Uh, he's trying to make all these adjustments, but we're just going to sing. Okay. So don't wait for the choir because if you do, you know, you'll be here for a couple of weeks waiting. So please sing. It's, it's a great thing to be able to worship the Lord. 20 people showed up, you know, in ready to have thunderstorms. They still showed up. And here's what they discovered, that if it was going to rain, they found out that they actually could come inside the building to worship at 830. Like, no one had thought of that. So anyway, so you guys are, are not only here and here to worship the Lord, but there's great wisdom. Great wisdom that you, hey, why not just come to a building? So great to have you here this morning. So if you, if you don't know who I am, I'm Father Taylor Albright, and it's my pleasure to welcome you this morning on behalf of this worshiping community that's been here in this building since, I think, 1872. So great to have you. In a moment, I'm going to say we're ready, and Mo's going to hit the switch. So this is your last chance to comb your hair. or to, If you want to be out of camera angle, you have to move out that way. So, uh, but we're going to worship the Lord. That's what we're here to do this morning, to wor worship the Lord. Very, there you go. You get a little more volume, a little more volume. is good then. All right. So, uh, so are you guys ready to worship? Yes. Oh, I like this group. We should get right to the sermon right now. You know, so, okay. <laughs> All right. So, Mo, we are ready to worship. Hey, so good morning. So I have been uh, literally warming up the group here uh, who is smart enough to come to the 945 service because we people who uh, were risking life and limb with lightning storms and rain, but we still worshiped in the parking lot at 8.30. Just in case you're home and you usually go to that service, uh, what we're going to do in the future is, I know it sounds crazy, but we're actually going to come in the building if it looks like it's going to rain, and we'll worship uh, at 8.30 in the building. So great to have you. If you're home on Zoom, we are so glad that you're here to worship. This congregation has come ready to worship, and so I hope you are too. So if you're here today with great thanksgiving for all the great things God's been doing in your life, if you're here this morning because you're seeking faith, what does that mean? Maybe you have something coming up this week, which you say, man, I'm depending on you, Lord Jesus. That's faith. So if you're seeking faith for what you're uh, meeting this week, or if you're in need of hope, which is where a lot of us begin, and we, we get there from time to time. So if you're here in in need of hope, then this, this table where God meets with us at this table, this table is for you, and we're glad you're here. So we're going to begin by beginning with this great hymn from Jesus' side. So if you please stand and sing.
Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And blessed be his kingdom, now and forever. Amen. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. be with you and also with you let us pray saying together almighty Almighty god God, the the fountain fountain of of all wisdom wisdom, you know know our necessities before we ask and our ignorance in asking have compassion on our weakness and mercifully give us those things which which for our unworthiness we dare not and for for our blindness blindness we cannot ask. ask Through the the worthiness of of your Son, Jesus Christ, Christ, our Lord, Lord, who lives and and reigns with you and the Holy Holy Spirit, Spirit, one God, God, now now and and forever. forever. Amen. Amen. So please be seated for the readings. The first reading is from Jeremiah. Woe to the shepherds who destroy and scatter the sheep of my pasture, says the Lord. Therefore, thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, concerning the shepherds who shepherd my people. It is you who have scattered my flock and have driven them away and you have not attended to them. So I will attend to you for your evil doings, says the Lord. Then I myself will gather the remnant of my flock out of all the lands where I've driven them, and I will bring them back to their fold, and they shall be fruitful and multiply. I will raise up shepherds over them who will shepherd them, and they shall not fear any longer or be dismayed nor shall any be missing, says the Lord. The days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will raise up for David a righteous branch, and he shall reign as king and deal wisely, and shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. In his days Judah will be saved, 
and Israel will live in safety. And this is the name by which he will be called. The Lord is our righteousness. The word of the Lord. Psalm 23, please join me in reading this. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not be in want. He makes me lie down in green pastures and leads me beside still waters. He revives my soul and guides me along right pathway for his name's sake. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I shall fear no evil, for you are with me. Your wad, your staff, they comfort me. You spread a table before me in the presence of those who trouble me. You have anointed my head with oil, and my cup is running over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. A reading from Paul's letter to the Ephesians. Remember that at one time you Gentiles by birth called the uncircumcision by those who are called the circumcision, a physical circumcision made in the flesh by human hands. Remember that you were at that time without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he is our peace. In his flesh, he has made both groups into one and has broken down the dividing wall, that is, the hostility between us. He has abolished the law with its commandments and ordinances that he might create in himself one new humanity in place of the two, thus making peace, and might reconcile both groups to God in one body through the cross thus putting to death that hostility through it. So he came and proclaimed peace to you who were far off and peace to those who were near. For through him, both of us have access in one spirit to the Father. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are citizens with the saints and also members of the household of God, built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the cornerstone. In him, the whole structure is joined together and grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are built together spiritually into a dwelling place for God. The word of the Lord. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to St. Mark. Glory to you, Lord Christ. The apostles gathered around Jesus and told him all that they had done and taught. He said to them, come away to a deserted place all by yourselves and rest a while. For many were coming and going and they had no leisure even to eat. And they went away in the boat to a deserted place by themselves. Now many saw them going and recognized them, and they hurried there on foot from all the towns 
and arrived ahead of them. As he went ashore, he saw a great crowd and he had compassion for them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And he began to teach them many things. When they had crossed over, they came to land at Gennesaret and moored the boat. When they got out of the boat, people at once recognized him and rushed about that whole region and began to bring the sick on mats to wherever they heard he was. And wherever he went, into villages or cities or farms, they laid the sick in the marketplaces and begged him that they might touch even the fringe of his cloak. And all who touched it were healed. The Gospel of the Lord. So let us pray. Gracious, present God, while we're here to worship you, Lord, the one thing that we would all want would be to hear you speak to us in some way, in some way today. So I pray, Lord God, that your Holy Spirit would be speaking to every person, whether they're in person here now or at home, to touch their hearts in that place, Lord, where they most needed to hear from you. Thank you for your gracious, loving care and your never-ending desire to see the whole world rescued, even us. We thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So please be seated. So fair warning, as I get ready to do the sermon, the sermon has questions in which I'd like you to answer. And this isn't, you know, this is like church, you know? So when you answer, you don't have to say it the Episcopal way, which is, no, no, we want to hear you say it out. Like if you have an answer or response, we, yeah, well, we got to hear it, okay? So people are now going, I knew we should have stayed home. No, all right, all right, all right. So you're going to be okay. There's, I'm not going to ask you any questions that you don't know the answer to. But here's what I want you to think about. And think about this story that if I was to tell you that starting in two weeks, I will not be the rector of this church, but I will be here as the assistant. But the new rector is Jesus, the, the one we read about in the Gospels. Jesus is going to be the rector of this church. Not the Jesus risen you know, ascended at the right hand of the Father, but, but the one literally down to earth Jesus, this Jesus as your rector. I don't know if he'll wear a collar or not, you know, who's going to say and who's going to tell him he should if he doesn't, but Jesus as your rector. So first off, how do you feel about that? Jesus becoming the rector of your of Trinity Church, Tarifa. How do you feel about that? Feel great. We'll see about that. All right, so, so you know, any time a new rector comes in, you know, if they're old enough and been around the barn enough, you know, they try to come in and they, they try to come in, they don't make a lot of changes at once. But Jesus, no one's been around the barn more than Jesus since he existed before the creation of the world. So I can't tell you if he's going to come in and be careful and think about all your traditions. But inevitably, the church is going to change once Jesus shows up. Wouldn't you agree? Yes, okay, so again, so a church language, to say I agree is to say amen. So you agree? Amen. All right, so at home, we have not become Dap Baptist, but anyway, we're, we're trying to give energy to a group that's been indoors with rain all week. So, so anyway, so Jesus come in and make changes. What was he, is the church going to look like if Jesus becomes rector of this church? And how are you going to feel about that? So that's what I'd like to ask you today, and I'd like to do it by looking at just the story we've heard. Now, quick background. The story we heard comes from Mark chapter 6, and if you were to look it up on your, you know, if you pulled up your, your phones right now, looked up on Bible Gateway, Mark chapter 6, what you would see is, hey, they edited the story, and it's true, and I think it's to our advantage. They took two stories out. 
it's, it's, so we have the beginning of a section and the end, and they took out two stories are the ones you know best. And that's why it's probably a good thing to take out. He took out, they took out the, uh, the feeding of the 5,000 and they took out uh, like what happens right after that is when they cross the sea in a boat. So the feeding of 5,000 is an Episcopal story. I don't know if you know that. So the feeding of 5,000, the vestry is there. Jesus as rector is there. He looked there, 5,000 people. None of them have come prepared. Nobody's ready to be there for the evening. No one has what they need. And so the vestry has a side meeting and they decide, let's talk to Jesus. And they say, Lord, you know, these people who you love, who've come unprepared, uh, are, are going to be stranded here. So send them away so they can go into town to get something. So the vestry had a very practical decision and they said to send them away. And then Jesus says this crazy thing. Well, what do you have? And that's when the vestry said, I just signed up to serve on vestry. I didn't serve up for this giving thing. So anyway, so that's a very much a vestry story. And they all, of course, they all get surprised because even though the people are unprepared, Jesus feeds them all. And then there's another vestry story. It's amazing how much the Episcopal Church is represented in the Gospels. The next story is that as they're crossing the lake, you know, all of a sudden there's a huge storm. And where's Jesus? Sleeping. So the vestry has one of those impromptu meetings again. And they take a vote on who gets to go down and wake him up. Right? And so, so anyway, so, just, just a, so that's a picture of some of the coming attractions if Jesus is to become your rector. And remember, you all said, we feel very good about that. Well, I'm just giving you a heads up. Okay, so here's what we're left with. The beginning of a story and the end of a story. And with taking out those big miracle stories, it allows you to see what Jesus is really all about. There are th different things going on in the story. So first of all, Every story in the gospel is ultimately about Jesus. And that's because of the good news. You know, we call it the good news. The biblical word for that is gospel. Thank you. This section over here is really on the ball today. You guys are going to have to catch up. So it's the gospel. And what is the gospel? The gospel is not that Jesus has come with a new ethic. Jesus has come with another way of doing the law. Jesus has come with a new way you can improve your life if you work really hard. Jesus, no, the gospel, this is why it's good news. God has a gift for you and it's already done. And here it is. Heaven is now coming to be on earth. That is to say, what we've prayed in the Lord's prayer, you know, thy kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven, that that has begun. Jesus is the one who announces that. And not only is, does he announce it, but he is the Lord of it. And so all those stories, including those stories I said were Episcopal stories, those miracles are simply evidence that there's something which can't happen in the old days, in the old way of the natural things that happen on earth. You can't take five loaves and some fish and feed 5,000 people, but you can if Jesus and the kingdom are present. You can't say to a storm, be still and have it happen unless something has changed. So those stories are indicators of that because Jesus is the one who is bringing in the kingdom, right? So he ultimately, everything continues to point to him because he is the, he says, I'm not only the way, but I'm the door. He's the one who's doing the inviting and that you don't have to do anything but say yes. Where do you get that these days? You know, you can sign up for all kinds of great programs. Well, ultimately, you have to do something. Here's the good news. Because of Jesus paying the price for us, the invitation to enter in to this place where God is present and where the kingdom of God is present, you can do that today simply by saying yes to the invitation to Jesus. That's the good news. And he is the one who brings it. So ultimately, all the stories are about him. But in this story, and I, and I would challenge you to yank up your uh, uh, bulletins with the story, because I'm going to say some things and you're going to say, where is he coming up with this? I'm just reading it to you, basically. But Jesus is working with a particular group of people is the focus of this. There's a second group of people, but there is one particular group of people that Jesus is working with in this story. And that is the group that we call the disciples. Now, 
Here's the first thing you have to know about Jesus becoming rector of your church. The first thing that Jesus does after he announces the gospel is to form a community. He does not say, I'm going to put this message out there so that individual people can take it or leave it and become, you know, they can believe and go home and do, no. He forms a group of people around him. And they're not just people who listen to him because they're called disciples. So disciples are what the community is ultimately about because the community is about them learning from Jesus, but not just learning like, here's what the life is like, and here's some best advice, you know, for your, that is not what he did. He is training them for a purpose, to do what he does. So Jesus makes the announcement, but he forms a community of people around him. And you'll notice in this community, and this is really, really, really important. What do the people, and remember, there are women, like they're not mentioned, but there are women as part of this community from the very beginning. In fact, it says that many of them uh, are the way that Jesus financed the ministry. So I'm just laying that out there, ladies. But, uh, but there are men and women in this community. What do they have in common? From what you know about the disciples, what do this, does this group share in common? Now you're asking Episcopal again. Is that my other type? No, no, no. Like, what, what, say it out loud. What do they have share in common? They're what? They're seeking God. Yeah, I'd say, okay, they're seeking God. But let me just cut to the chase. You have some people there that are just straight up blue collar people, right? Now, I don't care that if, you know, somebody's dad owns the company, but in those days, those got, you know, John and James and Peter and Andrew, you know, were not wearing like, you know, $400 suits, you know, and doing most of their work in an office, right? These are blue collar people. Work, get paid, go to the store, eat dinner. These are blue collar people. On the other hand, you got some wealthy guys who those guys don't even like in the group. More than what you have tax collectors, wealthy people who not only are they wealthy, but they're going a whole nother agenda as they're helping out themselves, profiting from so if you catch fish, you got to take it to market. When you go to the market, first thing guy you see is the tax collector. So you're already paying for these, these guys. They're not, they're not on the same page. These, some of the guys are giving you, the tax collectors also have to pay off the Romans. So these guys are not on the same page. Poor people, you got wealthy people. You have at least one guy who's basically from a terrorist organization because he wants a revolution. So these are not just all people who look alike and sound alike. And, I mean, this is a really diverse group of people. So they don't share a lot in common except for one thing. The invitation of Jesus is the one thing they share in common. They were all invited because of Jesus. So as you sit here and Jesus becomes your rector, you might say, well, these people live in Simsbury and that guy lives in Granby and... You know, I got, I got some couple here, they're, they're from Dag. We don't even know where Hamden, Massachusetts is, but you know, like, who are these people, right? So you got all, so Jesus says, well, first of all, don't forget that the one thing you have in common is that you've received a gift from me that you didn't deserve. He doesn't emphasize that, but we didn't deserve it. And that's what they share in common. So when you look at other people, you say, uh, what do, why am I thinking this guy has to, has to deserve it? So Jesus has a very pers different perspective on how do you form a community. So what is the primary thing that these disciples are here in the very first sentence? What is going on that Jesus is taking care of the community? What's going on? Come away. Why are, they, why are they coming away? Like, so come away means they're going on a retreat with the rectors taking them away. Why do they need to go on a retreat? Well, because they have been doing what Jesus does, and that is they are serving the third group in here, which Jesus calls, which Mark calls the many. So in this gospel, it's the many. So many see him, and Jesus spoke to many, and many get assembled. Who are the many? 
So many is a big category. And many are some people that are just interested because he's very entertaining. I saw the last show, God got healed. It was pretty wild. You know, people argued with him. Some people are just going because it's a thing. And they're, and they're sort of following around Jesus, but following is not the same as being a disciple in the community. Some people believe in, I think this guy is it, but they didn't join the community. They're part of the many. But what is the number one highly motivating factor that makes, that, that attracts people to Jesus? What is the one super motivating factor which is on people's hearts of why they're so attracted to Jesus? What is that? Healing. healing. And why do you need healing? Because you are, you're broken. Great work. You're broken. It's not just that you, you know, got a sickness. There are people that are broken. And you know these stories from what you've read about people who have gone to Jesus. There are lepers, and that lepers just isn't like, I got this terrible disease. No, you're cut off, and everybody says, well, why would this guy have leprosy if he hadn't been such a terrible sinner? That must be what that is. So they are cut off, and, and they're like seeking Jesus. A blind man on the side of the road, son of David, have mercy on me. These people are seeking Jesus, not because he is the most fascinating. He gives the best sermons. I always come away inspired. No, no, no. They're there because they are desperate. And Jesus has something that they think could be for them. Maybe, just maybe, it will be me. A woman said to him one time, said, if I could just get to him, if I could just somehow get to him and reach out and touch his garment, I know I would be healed. Wow. You know, if I could just get to Jesus. And Jesus is so accessible. The vestry members keep saying, shh, shh, we'll get to that, but we're not there in the meeting yet. Be quiet. People, you know, just want to get to him. Jesus, in this scene, they've gone on retreat. And I know if, you know, if it was me, I'd be going, what a great idea. I'm going on retreat with Jesus. It's a nice little island. And I think the sun is good. I hope they have great food, you know, and we're going away. And suddenly, oh my gosh, here they come. You know, well, Jesus is going to say, sorry, come back tomorrow. It's a retreat. What does Jesus do? You know, he's like, hey, get some chairs. You know, like, like, like here we go again. Jesus is very accessible to every person. And these people are not coming to him for theological reasons. They are coming to him because they're feeling hurt and broken. Those are people who are attracted to Jesus. Interesting. The disciples are excited. And I want you to also note, in the Gospel of Mark, I believe it's only twice does he use the word apostles. Starting in the book of Acts, people start to think about the word apostle differently because 12 of us were there, we followed him, we're witnesses, we should get a 12th now that Judas is gone. So that became known as apostles as witnesses to the resurrection. But here, apostles is like the, at the very heart of the word. Do you know what the word apostle means? Now, I know some of you are biblical scholars. What does the word apostle need nice and loud? Apostle means, means what? It means sent. I'm sorry, we're going to have to go back to school again. COVID, you lost everything. We're going to have to have some classes. It means sent, people who are sent. So they were sent out ahead of Jesus they were ministering to these many, many, many people. And they come back. And so Mark just calls them apostles because that's the group that was sent. We're going to come back to that in a second. But if you've ever been in church ministry or any kind of ministry, served as a nurse, served as a counselor, served as a school teacher, what do you know about serving people with needs? It's exhausting. Why? Because it's never ended. The disciples have just found out. They went out and they served and they did the stuff and they came back and now they're exhausted because they've been trying to serve the needs of the many. And now they're exhausted. And so Jesus says, go away, take some time off, call me when you get back, send me a text, we'll get together. No. Whenever Jesus, in, in the Gospels, the only time Jesus is not with the disciples is that Holy Week and, uh, and, and crucifixion. Otherwise, Jesus doesn't go anywhere without the disciples, and the disciples only go out from him when they're sent. Okay, so what does that look like so far when Jesus comes to be the rector of your church? 
Well, one of the things that you might have to think about is when you come at, let's say, 11 o'clock on Wednesday, because you're going to drop in and say, yeah, it was a really wonderful sermon, but you know, you can't preach that long. You're going to get to the office and Carol's going to say, ah, he's gone. He's not here. Why? Does Jesus ever, does he ever say what we really need is a big building? and a parking lot for people to come to. That's what would make this ministry work. There is never a building plan. However, some vestry members of the Episcopal, from the Episcopal vestry members, after a particularly great event, they decide to have a building program. Now, come on now, think about this. Where does that happen? Where does the vestry say, can we, let's, let's build a building? When does that happen? Transfiguration, who said that? Raise your hand. Yes, yes, we have a, so thank you. Thank you, Carol. So yes, what, you know, Jesus, at the Mount of Transfiguration, the three vestry members go up another meeting all week long. I got to work, I go to the meeting. And uh, if you've ever been on vestry, you know that's exactly how we feel. I used to be on the vestry before I was ordained and the same thing. So they go up the hill and, you know, and, and suddenly they're like, it's Moses, Elijah, Jesus transfigured. Man, we could get some people to come to this. So they say, hey, let's build not one or two, let's build three chapels right here, you know? We always want to make a building. Jesus never does a building. Why doesn't Jesus have a central location? Why doesn't he have a central location? Because he... Well, he's, well I mean, in the Gospels. Because he's always going. And where is he going? He's going to the many. He takes the disciples and he's going to people. Why? Because they are hurting and broken. This is the reason he does it. And he's got good news for them. It's the best news they would have ever heard. It's the best news they could hear. He's always going, 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 going. So when you come on Wednesday, you know, he might not be here. But let's talk about Sunday. So let's say the vestry gets him aside. The senior warden, you know, has that little, you know, like, I can't call that a come to Jesus moment, but like, you know, let's say it's that little moment where they say, look, you got to be showing up here on Sunday at least, because this is when we come to church. So you got to show up on Sunday. So who, if this is who Jesus attracts, who, if Jesus is going to be a rector, who is coming on Sunday to get to him? Who? All the broken people. All the broken people. And what do you know about broken people just in the Gospels? They don't follow any boundaries. Like, I don't see anything in the gospel. You know, we know the story. These four men brought their paralyzed friend. And the crowd was so big. So they called the owner of the house and they said, hey, I'm glad I got you. We need to get in. Can we come through your roof? Do you have a skylight? No, they just like tear the guy's roof up. Somebody's got to fix that. Can you imagine calling your insurance agent? Uh, well, we had a meeting at our house. The rector was there and now we got all on the roof. You know, like you're not going to get reimbursed. These people have terrible boundaries. He goes to a very expensive uh, dinner. Now people are there to kind of roast him, these Pharisees, but it's, these are wealthy people. They invite him to dinner and somebody break, who breaks in? That lady, that lady, don't you remember that lady? That lady was so thankful and she wanted to get to Jesus and she breaks into the party and she's weeping and she grabs his feet weeping and she washes his feet with her tears because she was so thankful for the healing, the forgiveness she's received. It's overwhelming. It's not just like a church thing, like she came to a confirmation, said some words and went home. Man, her life is transformed. And she just breaks all the boundaries and comes right into a party. Everybody's embarrassed except for Jesus, which is why you should think about it if you really want to have Jesus as your rector. Those people aren't, they're not churchified people. They don't come on time. You know, some of them come, then they don't come. There's nothing about they have money. They cost you money when they come, but they come for Jesus and they disrupt everything. That's what I see. These people, they shout out in the middle of sermons. You know, here, Episcopal. We got a couple of you here, but like, but anyway, so, so can you get this picture of what it would be like? What would Jesus be training you to do as, as disciples? He would be training, you'd be coming a community. You know what? You can come to church 
you know, when you can, but that doesn't make you part of a community because you don't know everybody. You can't share your life and, and you can't trust people enough to share your life with them unless you spend time with them. And we say, oh, but our lives are so busy. You know, we have very busy lives. We don't, it's, it's a, Jesus would be saying, we need to be a community. And he'd be having community events. And he'd be taking you away on a, on a, on, on a retreat. And just when you thought, well, at least I'll get relaxed, who knows what happens when you get there with Jesus. But he would be forming a community because you can't learn to love one another is just a pretty saying unless you're in a community of relationships. Because, you know, when, when Faith Naujax does something to offend me, or most likely the other way around, you know, in, in, in church, you can say, I was offended and I'm never going back there again. In community, we have to work it out. You know, we got to talk to each other. We got to figure out like, you know, I'm very, I apologize. Please forgive me. She has to bite down hard. Or I will forgive you. But you don't leave each other in community because you disagree. You know, you don't leave because you got offended. You have to learn how to love one. Those disciples were fighting it out the whole time. You know, James and John and their mom have a secret meeting with Jesus because they said, mom, ask him if we can have like the highest, best positions in the kingdom. And the other disciples are like, hey, what you're doing with, her, with your mom? They break out into a fight, right? But you got to be a community. So Jesus is building community, but a community being trained to go to the many, to go to the many. And the many start coming and the many are disruptive because they come and seek healing. So let me ask you again, how do you feel about Jesus being your rector? You know, the appropriate answer is, are there other candidates? <laughs> <laughs> right, right, yeah, right. And, and we always like to change and it's gonna, you know, it's, it's Jesus would be disruptive if he was the rector of your church. Now. I'm gonna tell you the truth of the whole thing, which I think you know, but maybe you haven't thought of. Jesus is the rector of your church. I don't mean me, but if Jesus is not the rector, the priest in charge of your church, you should not be here. Because I don't know what that is. You know, if it's something else besides Jesus being the leader, because the church is something that he built, he created, it's his. The mission is his, the invitation is his. So he has to be the rector of the church. From Jesus' time to now, there's a lot of history that has gone on in the world and how the church interacts and through culture in the world. I understand that. But some things have not changed. We might have in Connecticut the best health care in the entire, on the entire planet. If you think about the world, I mean, you only have to think for a moment about Kateri Wow, we have a hospital. We have a doctor who's there at least five days a week. They're rejoicing in healthcare. You know, we have every option in the world available to us. So we have all kinds of healthcare. But do people still suffer? Are people still broken? Are people still trying to work out their lives as if there was no God that somehow I can work this out, control my variables and my family and my situation, and then finally coming to what in the 12 steps is step one, I found that my life was unmanageable. That has not changed. In fact, I might say that the suffering that people in the state of Connecticut have might be more intense than the suffering that Jesus encountered because we have this belief that everything should be good and easy. And we have all these things. Why is my life so hard and broken? People are still hurting and sick going through difficulty. People wonder, my marriage has come to an end. Will I live again? Is the resurrection in this lifetime? That hasn't changed. Secondly, Jesus hasn't changed. Jesus didn't say, crucifixion is done, resurrection, ascension, and now, like, let me know how it's going. No, Jesus is still, every moment of every day, going reaching out to people and the people haven't changed because they're the ones, the ones who most likely to respond to Jesus are people in touch with their own pain and suffering. That hasn't changed. 
The question we have is, are we willing, even interested, in becoming a community, the community where Jesus is in the middle and the community that is, are like disciples who are listening, worshiping, but being trained and sent and willing to adapt what we have known and loved for the sake of Jesus and the many. Jesus brings good news and he brings it through us. So I say these words this morning to encourage you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. I just have to write down who answered questions here. Give you your points. All right. Now, if you'd please stand as we affirm what we have come to believe through the confession of the Nicene Creed. Saying together, we believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made, for us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He He will will come come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his his kingdom kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Lord Spirit, the Lord, Lord, the giver giver of life, who who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With With the the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church, We acknowledge one baptism, baptism, forgiveness of sins. sins. We We look look for the the resurrection of the dead dead and the life of the world world to come. come. Amen. Amen. So if you please be seated for three minutes, please have a seat. All right, so I left my clipboard outside. So we did this last week and we're gonna do this enough until you get practiced in how to do the prayers of people. I'm going to ask you three questions right now about areas of the world, areas within our country, and for whom people and situations you believe we need God's help in. So by that I mean like, so if you've seen something on the news and you say, oh my gosh, well, it's really, oh my Lord, please. So that's a request, you know, like, so so I'm going to ask you about the world, anything in our country, and then people. And we only have you know, two minutes and 30 seconds to do it. And I don't have a pen. So you may have to actually pray these prayers yourself. But I'll I'll give you a little practice. All right. So what have you seen in the news? That is, what have you become aware of in the wider world outside of the United States where we need to see God's help today? Flooding in Europe, right? So at least 170 people currently known dead, hundreds unaccounted for. So flooding in Germany. What else? Cuba. And you know, like, so with all the things going to Cuba, that's a really difficult situation. A lot of up in the air, praying for Cuba. What else? Haiti. Haiti. President assassinated. Poor country. Everyone's wondering what's going to happen. What else? I have to say that a little bit louder. COVID-19 around the world. It has not gone away. People are still struggling, suffering. COVID-19 around the world. Any place in particular? India, Brazil, right? So, so, so don't forget that. You know, I heard you say it now. You, you can say that again when we pray. Okay, so what else in the world? Nigeria, we're always praying for there. Things are always dicey, in, particularly in Kafanchan, 
you know, where Kateri is and up where uh, uh, Bishop John is, always dicey. Uh, trends with things that happened with the Fulani. Uh, people just, if you don't know, uh, in these villages, all of a sudden the Fulani Muslim tr uh, shepherds just come into a village and, and just in trucks, machine guns, people get killed. The bishop has to go out, identify bodies, you know, before the heat gets to them. Really rough situation, okay? One more thing that you may, I haven't mentioned, I'll just mention that in South Africa, uh, have, there's been rioting uh, after a former president was uh, uh, jailed, but the rioting is so intense that uh, South Africa has called up their entire National Guard, not like Connecticut National Guard. They've called up all of their uh, National Guard to try to bring order back to the country. So, you know, you know what happens when there's that kind of rioting, okay? So that's the world. Great, thank you. In our country, what are we praying for today? Wildfires. Wildfires. That... Relief, from the Relief from the drought. And those things have caused some other issues. When it's generally harvest time, you might read up that now there's, believe it or not, because of all those conditions, there have been gas shortages and people are literally stealing gas just to work their stuff. It's like a third world. I mean, that ha that's happening in the middle of America, right? So wildfires, drought, all of those issues. What else in America? Gun violence. Washington Nationals last night, middle of the game, three people got sh get shot in the parking lot in the capital of our country, not the capital of some other foreign third world nation, our country. So gun violence and not just the guns, but it's what happens in the culture that causes that. And wow, sounds like you need a bunch of disciples and the power of Jesus to go out, right? So anyway, so just to put a little side extra in there. What else in our country? Tell a little more about that. Okay, so our education system. All right. Also, I also want to mention that, you know, believe it or not, though the, tr the transfer of COVID rate in Connecticut, at least the last couple of weeks, has been at one or less than 1%. We have major cities right now where COVID is just the way it was back in December and January. I mean, think about that. Like they opened things up. Uh, people have not been vaccinated. And now, of course, you know, COVID has uh, spread. And what they're seeing more and more is, is the people who are not vaccinated, including children who we once thought were like, was somehow like, you know, we children don't get COVID, all these cases of kids and some in ICU. Good grief. So we got to pray for this, you know, for us and for our nation. Anything else in our nation that you want to pray about? Right. I mean, so, so we, you know, new, a new cycle lasts just a couple of days. We were already moving past the fact that people were having dinner on their, you know, patios in a condo that you're, you know, mother-in-law was down there in Florida enjoying her retirement and this condo just collapsed and most of those people have not been found but now they're moving away the debris think of the horror the pain how do you grieve so a lot to pray about there okay people now, I'm going to tell you a couple of things right off the top uh, you guys know uh, Donna Benware is here today her husband Sonny is going in for a surgery, which is scheduled to not only start tomorrow morning, but not end until 6 p.m. is what the surgeons have said as they're praying for uh, dealing with his heart. I mean, people go in for like some of these heart surgeries and it just looks like we hardly blink anymore. We need to be praying for him and for her. So praying for Sonny Benware for surgery tomorrow. What else? Anita, okay, we're praying for Anita. People with cancer, Bob Malley, who had recently found out that he was in remission, has been in the hospital for most of this week with fevers and vomiting and just all the side effects of his medication. His family is ready to go, you know, they were Saturday gonna go on vacation. So think about that, when you're just graduated from high school and now your family's going, you wanna go on vacation and your dad is saying, just go, I'm in the hospital, go without me, right? We had, so who else are we praying for with cancer? Jeff Fournier, praying for Jeff Fournier. Who else? Nancy Fossum, Mark Little, 
uh, Jerry Lavalle's niece, Tara, another friend of hers, Reggie. Who else? Anyone else? This week, John Hart, John Hart's already been seeing all the pre-op stuff, but John Hart goes in for a surgery, a big surgery this week. Uh, and so we're praying for John and for the whole family. All right, now, you guys know names. Now, here's what I'm asking you to do. When it comes time for the prayers, you've already said, oh, pray for this, pray for that. Just, you don't have to like write a paragraph. Just say these things that you've said. Bring this up in prayer. What I ask you to do is, do not mumble it out because the reason, you know, the word amen at the end of prayers basically means I hear that prayer and I agree with it, like two or three agreeing. So say it loud enough for us to hear it. It may, may seem awkward at first, but hey, this, this, you don't have to use your big outdoor voice, but use your sort of outdoor voice, right? You know, like make it loud enough so we can hear and we can continue to pray for you, all right? And at home, you know, you know the drill. We've asked you every week to send your prayer requests in on Zoom and uh, via Facebook. And, uh, you know, those come to me right here. I'm already getting some of these requests today. Great. Thank you so much for your participation. The more we practice this, you know, we won't have to, uh, you know, I won't have to, like, give you the preface. You'll just go, I know. We've got to pray for the world and the country. And, right? So we're going to do that. So we're just going to, so, so Mo, we're just going to go right to the prayers. No musical interlude. We're just going to go straight up to the prayer. So if you would please stand. As the people of God, who have been made children of God through Jesus, we have this particular role to come before God and to offer these prayers Jesus right now is interceding for us and the whole world at the right hand of the Father. In the book of Revelation, it says that the intercessions and prayers of the saints rises up to God like incense. So we are now part of that group raising up these prayers. In peace, we pray to you, Lord God. For all people in their daily life and work, for our families, friends, and neighbors, and for those who are alone. For this community, the nation, and the world. For justice, freedom, and peace. For the just and proper use of your creation. For the victims of hunger, fear, injustice, and oppression. For all who are in danger, sorrow, or any kind of trouble. For those who minister to the sick, the friendless, and the needy. For the peace and unity of the Church of God. For all who seek the gospel and all who seek the truth. For our presiding Bishop Michael, our Bishops Ian and Laura, and all bishops and other ministers. For all who seek the God and his church. And now I invite your prayers for the concerns on your hearts this morning, starting with the concerns you have in the wider world. Please lift your prayers to the Lord. Yes, Lord Jesus, we know that you gave your life because you love this world. We do intercede in all these places in all of these places, for you to come and to act. We also pray for our country. Where are we asking for God's intervention this morning in our country? For an end to gun violence. Wildfire. And we also pray, Lord, for our leaders, for our president, vice president, the members of Congress, Supreme Court, Lord, every person who holds authority in this, Lord, we pray, Lord, that you would guide the hearts of all who lead. And we pray that you would raise up leaders, Lord, who would help us to overcome our deep differences, and you would bring a spirit of unity and reconciliation in our country. We pray for those areas where the virus has come again, we pray, Lord, for common sense around vaccines and health. 
We pray ultimately, Lord, particularly for the protection of those most vulnerable, for people who are older and particularly for children, we pray. Please give guidance, I pray, Lord God, for uh, the health of this whole nation. And Lord, we also pray for those people and situations which are on our hearts this morning. For whom and why are we praying for them this morning? Mm, yes. For Rich, for Debbie, Joan, Sharon. Yes, so for all of these needs and the needs that are on our hearts that may have been unspoken, we lift them to you because we know that it matters to you and we pray for your intervention. Hear us, Lord. For your mercy is great. We thank you, Lord, for all the blessings of this life. Just think for a moment of one thing that you're thankful for this morning and offer that as a as an offering to the Lord. Just one thing. Loud enough for the Lord to hear it. Thank you. And oh, Father, we are thankful most of all for your grace that doesn't come to us as a theological idea, but it comes to us in the person of Jesus and the invitation of grace. Thank you, Lord. And for that reason, we will exalt you, O oh God, our King. We praise your name forever and ever. We pray for all who have died, that they may have a place in your eternal kingdom. Remembering especially today, Frank Clark and for Rainbow Share, for whom yesterday's services and prayers were offered. Lord, let your loving kindness be upon them. Who we'll put their trust in you. We pray to you also for the forgiveness of our sins. Have mercy upon us, most, most merciful, merciful Father. Father. In your, your compassion, compassion, forgive us our sins, sins known and, and unknown, things done and left undone. undone. And so now uphold us by your spirit, spirit that we may live and serve you in newness of life, to the honor and glory of your name. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you. Forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen you in all goodness and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. Amen. And now the peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you. Carefully greet one another with peace and peace. Just for a moment, uh, we have a lot of things which are going on and brewing, so to speak, but I just want to make an announcement on one thing and then just a little piece of our service, and that is this. Have you ever in your work life or in, like, I think for many of you, your retirement life is busier, at least in work life, there was like an end of the day in your crazy retirement lives as I watch them, you're busier than ever. But in all of those, have you ever said, man, 
I need a break. Have you ever had that feel like, boy, I just need a break? And you want to get refreshed. You're like, man, if I could just get away and get refreshed. But God does that. And oftentimes, you know, we know that we have received the Holy Spirit the moment we believe. But Paul says to pray to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Sometimes you just need to be in God's presence and to have the experience of being filled with the Holy Spirit. This Tuesday night at 6.30, right here, I mean, you're welcome to stay all the way till Tuesday, but right here in the church, we are going to have that opportunity for you. It's a service which is simply focused on some time of worship at the beginning. I have a guy who just led a five-day retreat at a big retreat house on the Holy Spirit, this very thing, who will be here Tuesday night to help us to be reminded about what we may have come to know and some things we didn't know about the Holy Spirit, but suddenly to have our faith renewed and to pray to be filled with the Holy Spirit once again, to have that time of refreshing. Now, what happens when you pray that prayer? I can't tell you because that's not up to me. The Holy Spirit is a person who will come and minister to you at your greatest depth of need. And if you say, I don't know, well, maybe nothing happens. That is never the case. That doesn't mean that you'll cry or weep or laugh. But I guarantee you, when you ask for the Holy Spirit, God gives you the Holy Spirit. And so that will happen here Tuesday 6.30, and you're all invited. Uh, Do you have to register? It's helpful because I know what to plan for, but if you show up Tuesday and say, I didn't register, I'm just happy to see you that you're uh, accepting this invitation from the Lord. Can you invite other people? You can invite everybody. If you think you know somebody among the many, as we just talked about, somebody hurting, somebody in need, you know, give them an invitation, say, Hey, come and find Jesus. The Holy Spirit makes him present. So that's Tuesday, 6.30 right here. Now about the service, you guys have been great so far. I love you guys have been participating, shouting out some answers. I heard your prayers. It was great. Uh, one last little tip is oftentimes during the, during the preparation of the table, uh, we have what's called the offertory. The original service, the offertory, is the height of the service because now after you've been ministered to, you come and bring an offering, right? But now it's become for us kind of a spectator sport like, okay, there's a little bit of a break. You know, in Southwick, we called it halftime. It's really not halftime. You know, it's it's a participatory thing. And we're going to have a song that you see here, uh, the Agnes Day, the sung version. So as we are setting the table, I would, you can stay seated but I'd ask you to go ahead and sing as part of your worship. All right? Great. Walk in love as Christ loved us and gave him so for us an offering and sacrifice unto God. This is where we cue the Agnes Dei.
And now if you'd please stand. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who on the first day of the week overcame death and the grave and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of eternal life. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels, with all the company of heaven who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. Holy, 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 holy Lord, Lord, God of power and might, heaven, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy and gracious Father, in your infinite love, you made us for yourself. And when we had fallen into sin and become subject to evil and death, you in your mercy sent Jesus Christ, your only and eternal son, to share our human nature, to live and die as one of us, to reconcile us to you, the God and Father of all. He stretched out his arms upon the cross and offered himself in obedience to your will, a perfect sacrifice for the whole world. On the night he was handed over to suffering and death, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread, and when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body which is given for you, do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ, Christ has, has died. died. Christ, Christ has risen. risen. Christ will come again. We celebrate the memorial of our redemption, O Father, in this sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. Recalling his death, resurrection, and ascension, we offer you these gifts. Sanctify them by your Holy Spirit to be for your people the body and blood of your Son, the holy food and drink of new and unending life in him. Sanctify us also that we may faithfully receive this holy sacrament and serve you in unity, constancy, and peace. And at the last day, bring us with all your saints into the joy of your eternal kingdom. All this we ask through your Son, Jesus Christ, by him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Amen. And now as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to pray, our Father, our Father who art who in, heaven, in heaven, hallowed, hallowed be, be thy, thy name, thy kingdom come, come thy will be done, done on earth, earth as it is in heaven. heaven. Give, Give us, us this day our daily, daily bread and, and forgive us our trespasses, trespasses as, as we, we forgive, forgive those who trespass against us. And lead, lead us not into temptation, temptation but, but deliver us from evil, evil. Thine, thine is the, the kingdom, kingdom and the, the power, power and the glory forever. Forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast. Hallelujah. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world. Have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world. Have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world. Grant us peace. The gifts of God for the people of God, take them in remembrance that Christ died for you 
and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving. The body of Christ, the bread of heaven. <laughs>
and let us be swift to love and make haste to be kind to one another, going forth into the world in the name and way of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Alleluia, alleluia. Thanks be to God.